Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It is Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. I am delighted to be back with Professor Julia Greer. Julia, it's always great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming again. It's always so much fun. Awesome. Today we're going to pick up the beginning of your undergraduate career. You proved your aunt wrong. You got into MIT. That was the place for you. So just in terms of your own identity, when you started at MIT, did you feel American at that point? Were you sort of enough assimilated that that was not an additional challenge on top of all of the challenges that a freshman at MIT would experience? <clears throat> you know, for the first time, I didn't feel like an outsider. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to high school, you're the only one that's an immigrant, right? Like yeah. there weren't that many immigrants in upstate New York, and there were pretty, it was pretty homogeneous, actually. It was pretty homogeneously white, and it was pretty American. Yeah. And then I went to MIT, and there are all kinds of people from all over the world, from all over the place, and I was like, this is so great. Like, I don't need to be the only, the odd one out anymore. So it's not so much that I felt American, but it was very much like I felt accepted. I felt like this is finally the place for me. Like, I don't need, I don't stand out in any way. I just, I'm just one of all these people. I mean, that's, it was quite empowering, actually. Did you think it was going to be mathematics at first that you were going to focus on? No. So this is kind of a funny part about my upbringing, I guess. So I went to a math high school in Russia, which means that it was pretty advanced math-wise. So when we moved to the States and I was a junior, I had already taken BC Calc. So there was nothing that the high school could offer me. Right. So I took... Um, uh, college level classes at RIT. So my dad was free at Rochester Institute of Technology. My dad was freezing, walking around in the Rochester winter, like sort of doing laps around you know the building while I was doing my math class at RIT because I couldn't drive yet. I was 15 or 16. I w wasn't able to drive yet. Um, and so I took everything. I took multivariable calc and uh, differential equations and linear algebra. I think I basically took all the classes that were required uh, for any college. So I didn't have to take any math classes in MIT at all. I did just for fun, but um, when I got there, I was like, well, I don't know what to major in. I mean, like, math is not all that interesting anyway. N not interesting, but I felt like I'd already taken all the math requirements, so, like, what else is there to do? Um, a bunch of my friends, I also really liked chemistry very much, and so a bunch of my friends said, well, you should do chemical engineering. And I was like, all right, I made some friends, and they were like, chemi is the way to go, so I went chemi chemical engineering, so no math. <laughs> right to chemi. From, right to chemi. From the beginning. Yep. And that worked for you. Yep. What did you like about it? I don't, because I switched to material science. <laughs> How soon chemi after? Chemi. No, no, in grad school. Oh, in grad school. Yeah. So I did, no, I got my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, but boy, I'd had it with liquids and gases. I like solids a lot better. Yeah. So I, so chemi is all about liquids and gases and all these dimensionless numbers. But in material science, it's solids. So I feel a lot more grounded in my solid world now. So I switched in at Stanford. What was your experience like as a student at MIT? It's a loaded question. Uh, it was a very multifaceted experience, right? So it wasn't all the freshman year was great. I loved freshman year. I loved being independent, and I loved making all the friends. And um, I was do, I was on the piano scholarship too, so I right. made a lot of friends with music, and I got a lot of opportunities to play. I was finding my way not only, you know, I was 17, so young, right? So I was kind of finding my way, uh, being both exhilarated by all this freedom, but also like unprepared for life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there really was a big sort of transformation. Making friends really, really helped. Playing about, I learned how to play trumpet. Do you want to hear a funny story about Please. this? Please. Actually, it's a really funny story. So when I was in high school, I started dating this boy, Toby, and he played the trumpet. I didn't. I was a pianist. I don't play trumpet. I play trumpet very badly now, but that was not my thing. So <laughs> MIT had this women's and pre women's preview weekend. So on April 23rd of whatever year, the 93, I guess, they flew all the women and minorities uh, to visit campus before everybody else arrived. So here I was. Oh my gosh! Like MIT, this is so great. Meeting all, making all. So that's where I actually made a few friends before I even started. And this girl, super enthusiastic girl, who's already a student there, comes up to me as part of this weekend, and she says, oh, hi, you know, my name is whatever, whatever. Um, do you play any instrument? And I was like, oh, yeah, I play piano and trumpet. And then I was like, what the hell? Like, why <laughs> did this come out? It just, like, came out. <clears throat> Sorry. She could care less that I was a pianist. She just, like, immediately, like, 
last touch of the trumpet. She's like, you play the trumpet. This is so awesome. I play in a concert band. You should come join the concert band and blah, blah, blah. And, and basically, the more she talked, the more oh, no. um, terrified I got because I was like, she's going to remember me. She's going to seek me out when I get there. And I don't know how to play the trumpet, but boy, she's going to come and recruit me. So I went back home and I was like, Toby, you need to teach me how to play the trumpet <laughs> right now. So in three months, three months, that was in April from April to August, I learned how to play the trumpet because I was terrified that this girl, who I'm sure had graduated, had forgotten all about me, was going to find me and make me play in band. So I came to MIT fully knowing how to play like a whole bunch of like little tunes. I got my own trumpet. I did all that and I played a concert band and that's where I actually eventually met my husband. So oh, wow. <laughs> I was the worst chair and he was like the second to worst chair. We were both pretty bad. At MIT. At right. MIT. Yeah, he, not at that time. Eventually he became my husband. Right, right. Yeah, so it was a funny story about playing the trumpet. Did you feel at home at MIT just in terms of being surrounded by students who love science? I felt at home at MIT because everyone was just accepted. Like everyone, everyone was a nerd. Yeah. Everyone, it wasn't even so much that they loved science, it's just like everybody thought in the same way. It was really, especially now, like I so appreciate that how much I took that for granted. Just like everybody was really smart and everyone thought in the way that like logic made sense, you know, and like you just hanging out with people was just really a rewarding experience. It was really hard though, so like halfway through I decided I was going to run away to Juilliard because it was too hard. I felt like everyone was smarter than me. Um, it was tough, um, so at some point I was like, forget this whole thing, I'm just going to go play piano. Um, at Juilliard, packed my bags and went to the Greyhound station. <laughs> Got pretty far. Um, yeah. By senior year, everything sort of changed. Did someone talk you out of it or you talked yourself out of it? I talked myself out of it. I was like, all right, this is just a stumble in the road. It's going to be okay. So I went back. I love, I actually really loved it. I did so much. I did theater. I did Circle K. I was eventually the president of Circle K organizations, this like community service uh, organization. I played in band. I played in orchestra. I was on this piano scholarship. I had great friends. I rowed varsity crew. I was a rower. I tried a lot of things. It I don't know. Like it was awesome. It was a great play. I cross registered with Harvard. Took a philosophy because we could. Um, took a philosophy class that I slept through every single one of them. I also took a bartending class, which was a lot more <laughs> entertaining. <laughs> Um, I took graduate level classes, I did projects, we bonded so much, explored Boston, that's why I started rollerblading, actually, uh -huh. is in Boston too, with my best friend, we went to, remember when like malls were a thing, we sure. went to a mall, Cambridge Side Gallery, and uh, found this random sports store there, and I was like, this is it, I'm going to get this, and she's like, do you even know how to rollerblade, and I was like, no, but I'm going to figure it out, so I put on my rollerblades and rollerbladed all the way back to my dorm, yeah, it was good times. It just, you know, thinking back to it, it just feel, I felt so unafraid. Like, the world we live in now is so horrific, right, with the war in Ukraine and the school shootings and, like, all this horrible stuff that's happening in our world now and that we are so aware of it. I just felt like being at MIT, I was not a part of any of that. Like, it was just, it was that small world that was so awesome with great people, with amazing activities. Um, yeah, it was great. Now playing the piano was that more an outlet or was that an educational experience where you furthered your training it was very intense yeah oh yeah that scholarship program cut no corners like we were expected we got lectured all the time you guys are the creme de la creme what kind of performance is this we got yelled at a lot yeah because we were underprepared mit is tough right like you actually spend a lot of time on problem sets and a lot of time on studying and a lot of time doing schoolwork. so it wasn't Practicing piano was a huge second priority, but yeah. second priority nevertheless. So we were never up to snuff, basically. And so we got yelled at a lot <laughs> by our professors. And, you know, at the end of the day, like, we ha I had to do a senior recital, like a full-on solo senior recital. We had to go play at the MIT Lincoln Labs. We had to go play at the MFA, Museum of, Museum of Fine Arts. Um, yeah, it was a lot of demands. It was very intense. What kind Not of, an outlet. What kind of music did you focus on? as a college student? Like, what were your favorite oh, all composers? Classical. All classical. All classical, very rigorous classical upbringing. So Brahms, Rachmaninoff, Schumann, Beethoven. I still, to this day, play the Schumann piece that I learned back then. That was a part of my recital. I still, that's like my one go-to piece. Whenever people ask me to perform, which happens a lot, that's my go-to piece. 
Were there professors that you became close with at MIT? Definitely. Definitely, definitely. Their professors were just as quirky as the kids, so it was neat. Yeah, I had a chemical engineering professor, Mike Moore, who actually died, but he was awesome. There was a take your professor to lunch day where the undergrads would you know, choose the most popular professor and we'd go with him. Like, you, MIT really knows how to do undergrad education. Like, yeah. they really made it fun. And they really made it interesting. And they really, there was Professor Bertozzi, this big, jolly physics guy who was totally Italian, who just, like, brought this little Italian mafia feel into his physics classes. Yeah, yeah, definitely did. Definitely with my music teachers, too, with my music professors. Um, that was a big part. I, I minored in music. Right. Yeah. What did you do during the summers? Did you stay in Cambridge? I did research. No, 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 no. I went to, you know, they have these RU programs, research experience for undergrads, through NSF. Oh. So I did one in Virginia Tech. That was my last one, I think. One at the University of Rochester, back home. Two in Rochester. One at the University of Rochester, one at RIT um, in Virginia. And I think that's it, right? How many summers are there? Freshmen? There's three summers. Yeah, there's only three summers. So those are the ones. When did you... When did you figure out that you wanted to go to graduate school? What was that process like? Was you there know, a professor who said, you got to go to graduate school? Was there somebody in particular who encouraged you? You know, if I actually really think about this, um, the imposter syndrome is pretty strong. Yeah. I think just in me for sure, but also just in my group of friends. Like everyone, my best friend went to med school. Um, and I never thought I'd be good enough to go to grad school. There was just no way, you know. So I didn't think I was going to get in anywhere. But it just happened to be that at, in my last year, things always happen at the end. In my last year, I took a graduate polymer science course. It was within chemi, but it was a graduate level class. And it was the first time that I took a graduate level class. And I did really well in that class. And I really liked it. And I was like, maybe this is it. Like, maybe I can do polymer science. So I really wanted to go to Berkeley. In chemical engineering. I don't know why. Like, that was my dream. Because I'd never been to California yet. Or maybe it was like, I went to, so I was dating this boy who moved to Berkeley to do grad school, and I went to visit him. And I think I just loved the Golden Gate Park so much. Like, I just loved San Francisco and loved the Golden Gate Park that I really wanted to go to Berkeley. Remember that? I didn't get into Berkeley, but I got into everywhere else. So I got, it, especially to the University of Delaware, that was, um, that has a great polymer science program, right. specifically yes. for polymer science. So I think that the grad school thing was just more like to prove to myself that maybe I'd get it. I didn't think I was going to get in anywhere, uh, but I did. And the only place that I wanted to go to, Berkeley, I didn't get into that. So I didn't want to go to Stanford. So what happened was that I decided to do the gap year. So I came to Cal but and I really wanted to come to California. And then this guy, the other guy who played the trumpet, he went to Berkeley in chemi, and I was super mad. So this guy had like a 4.0 from MIT, straight A's, got into a chemi program at Berkeley, and I was like, that schmuck guy, I want to go to <laughs> Berkeley for chemi. I didn't get in. Um, but I also moved to the Bay Area independently of him. So he went to Berkeley. I moved to the Bay Area to work at Intel. So I got an internship at Intel for an entire year, and it was the best year of my life. It was so awesome. So basically I deferred the University of Delaware. So I decided I was going to go to Delaware to do my PhD in polymer science, but I deferred it for a year. So this is something you can do in grad school. So I went and visited all the places that I got into, and I really liked Delaware, and so I just deferred it. Was it all polymer science programs except for chemi at Berkeley that you applied to? No, 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 no. It was only one, the opposite. It was only one program that wasn't chemi. I see. Yeah, it was one polymer science program in Delaware. Everything else was chemi. Stanford chemi, everything chemi. Yeah, so that year that I worked at Intel was a little bit pivotal in multiple ways, but one of them was that I, the projects that I worked on at Intel were like all solid metal films and thin films and transistors and semiconductors. And I was like, this is so awesome. So I really shifted towards materials, and this, the project that I had mm -hmm. there was in collaboration with a professor at Stanford. Now, this professor wasn't really a professor. He's an adjunct professor. But I didn't know. I was really young. Sure. Like, I was young. You don't know those distinctions. Yeah, we don't know any of those distinctions. We don't understand what is an adjunct. We don't understand grad school at all. And I was particularly young because I started college at 17. Right. So I was 21. Like, I wasn't even pretty young in every way. 
So that project was in collaboration with Stanford. And so I got to go to Stanford every week. And I was like, this is so great. This is totally awesome. Too bad I'm going to Delaware. And so like in May, in May of that year, the boy, his name is Frank, was like, hey, I really like you. You should really stay here. Well, and of course, like, I loved my life in the Bay Area. I had my best friend. I had my awesome friend group. I mean, like, who wouldn't love California, right? Like, and especially the Bay Area. We went, I became the social director of the entire group of interns. You know, we went everywhere. We went hiking. We went scuba diving. We just, like, did boating, kayaking, everything. Like, it was the best year of my life. And I realized that I really liked material science. So he said, why don't you not go to Delaware? You should really stay here. So I applied to Stanford again. Not, well, again, I guess from the previous year, right? And I basically wrote to them and I said, you know, I applied to Stanford's chemi department last year and you guys were generous enough to admit me. I'm not at all interested in chemi, but is there any way I could get into material science? And so they transferred my application, I guess, and they admitted me to material science. But who applies to grad school in May? You apply to grad school like now, like you apply to grad school in December or in January. So like right now in February, we selected, we already selected all the grad students. So from February to May. Yeah. And I applied to grad school in May. And they basically were like, uh, we'll admit you, but only into the master's program. We can't admit you into your, into the PhD program because we don't have any more fellowships. As you, you know, like that's the most, um, that's the most important. Right. Like COVID, that's the part that the department. Now as a professor, you understand what I understand that we've given away all the fellowships. So I got in and I basically went to that same adjunct professor and I said, hey, so you know how we've been working on this project with Intel. Um, how about I do this same project for you or like how about we work on this project still together with me being a grad student, yeah. your grad student, right? Now, I should mention that professor is an adjunct faculty member, so which again, I didn't know at the time. I was like, we're just doing research, it's really great. So I took classes. So I ditched Delaware twice at that point. So I think I'm a persona non grata <laughs> in the state of Delaware. Um, Frank and I got engaged, so that worked out really well for us um, at that time. I was taking all the classes in material science, so I completely switched from liquids and gases and chemi to solids and atoms, and that was really hard, actually. Switching switching from one major yeah. in undergrad to an entirely different major in grad school right. was hard. So let's go back to Intel. What, what was the project you were working on there? What was it? It was stresses in thin films. It's basically understanding, so you have a microprocessor, and the microprocessor has some transistors in it, and then it also has contacts through metal wires for how that transistor communicates with the rest of the microprocessor. Right, so there's a lot of steps which require you deposit a thin film and then you pattern it into lines and you pattern it into the so-called vias and contacts. So I was studying the effect of how the stresses, the mechanical stresses that build in thin films affect their um, uh, electronic properties. Did you ever think about staying at Intel, just pursuing a career there, not going to graduate well, school? Well, funny, funny, if you will allow me to continue with the story, Please. You'll, you'll find out. So, uh, because I was an intern, there was a discrete termination date. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't, like I, um, I was in a particular program. I was in an internship program. And in fact, I had to finagle my way to stay an extra six months. He was supposed to, because I wasn't in school anymore. Right. Right. So the program, the internship program that they had was for undergraduate researchers for only six months. And I was neither one of those because I had graduated already from MIT and it was my gap year. And, um, I really wanted to stay there for a whole year. So I had to go pull some strings and I sort of convinced them. Now, because there was a certain termination date, I had to figure out what to do. And I definitely wanted to get a PhD for sure. So I went to Stanford, right? But got on only in the master's program. And then the professor who was chair of the department at that time basically said, oh, it's no big deal to transfer from the master's program to the PhD program. Such a huge lie, but I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. Sorry. So I was working with this adjunct guy. I was taking all the classes with all of my classmates, preparing for qualifying exams, right? Like, and all that. And so one day I come to work, it was in 2000. And the guy, the professor guy, says, you know what, Julia, Intel cut my funding. And I was like, yeah, okay, that's really nice. What are we gonna do today? Like, it just didn't, re I didn't know what that meant, yeah. right? And he was like, no, I don't think you understand. Like, I can't support you anymore. 
And I was like, what do you mean you can't support me anymore? And he's like, well, I don't have any more funding for this project. And in general, I think you're a bad scientist. Like, uh, this is not, women shouldn't get PhDs, and you're a bad scientist. And, this, and we were building this amazing diffractometer. This, this other grad student and I were building this x-ray diffractometer that was so special and so awesome when we built it from scratch. I learned so much. I learned from um, everything from soldering the little motherboard, like, uh, um, uh, circuits and logic, you know, on these little um, uh, PCB green boards, you know, like motherboards, um, to constructing this furnace, to operating an x-ray source, to like everything. We built everything from scratch, this guy, uh, to writing code in Fortran. So like everything was, we built all this stuff for him and then he was like, I think you're a bad scientist and you should just like... Was this your first encounter with this caveman perspective of yeah, the women in science? Yeah, it really was. It really was. It was an amazing whiplash um and i was julia rosolovsky at that time and so like if i were the julia Greer that i am today i'd probably punch the guy out but like at this point at that point i just i was like yep he's right and i'm a bad scientist so i went and cried for a while and then i was like so then i went home we lived in san francisco and i was like frank this guy thinks i'm a bad scientist oh because he was an adjunct there was no one to champion my case to stay in grad school yeah so basically if i had worked for a real professor Th that person would have s stood up for me, presumably, yeah. right? Because I was actually did a great job. Like, but looking at it now, like even objectively, just yeah. looking at what we had accomplished in that amount of time, right? We built it, an incredible instrument from scratch. Like most grad students don't do that, so we really did a great job. This other guy, Matt, and I. Um, what were the science objectives of the instrument? To measure the stresses in, st in thin films. Okay. So you basically measure the lattice spacing using X-rays. Right, and so if your film is strained, you're gonna get a bigger lattice constant as a function of temperature. So we built even a furnace with a beryllium window so that the x-rays could go through it. So it was a very, very precise, usually these kinds of experiments you can only do in the synchrotron. Right. So we basically built a diffractometer that is able to measure the lattice spacing in these copper films or whatever metal films without having to go to the synchrotron at different temperatures. And so we really saw the evolution of lattice spacing as a function of temperature and how it all, um, uh, yeah, played out. It was it was awesome. It was an awesome project, and I'm so disappointed that nothing ever came out of it. Like we didn't even get a paper out. Somebody got a thesis out of it. I think somebody who worked on it before. But like, we were so close. We could have like all we needed to do was actually take some data using this technique. We would have really published it, you know. But then the guy was like a, a dinosaur, basically. He was pretty old. So Frank is in his PhD program at Berkeley. Here I am about to master out, and I basically made him promise. I was like, look, I'll support, like, I will go work at Intel, because that's where I see myself. My future is going to be at Intel. I'm going to go work at Intel, and I'll support us, because we lived in San Francisco. Not cheap, right? Not a cheap place. Uh, um, and so we'll live like that on the promise that I will get to go and finish my PhD after you are done. So that was our agreement. So that is exactly what happened. So I did work at Intel for two and a half years as a real person, not as an intern. They took me back. It, it was a different department, actually. But they took me back. And then what happened was that when he finished, he, oh, he had always wanted to be a professor. So he started applying, I guess, at the end of his PhD, and um, nothing really took. I never, ever wanted to be a professor. I was working at Intel. I'm happy at Intel. But then, because we had this deal, I was like, all right, I'm going to apply to grad school again. And because I'd taken all these classes at Stanford, like I was ready for a qualifying exam, right? It made sense to go back to Stanford if they were to accept me. So same thing happened. I got in, and then they're like, but we don't have a fellowship for you. So you're gonna have to find an advisor who can support you. So I went to the visiting day, which is kind of silly, because I already knew, like my cohort, the people in my cohort were fifth years now, right? Because like I did the masters with them and then I worked for two and a half years. So they're all either ready to graduate or, or have already graduated, but you know, I stayed friends with them for the most part. Um, and I'm looking for an advisor and I'm like, all right, well, so I talked to a bunch of people. Uh, there was this one very, very, very famous professor, Bill Nix, there is one very, very famous professor, Bill Nix, that, who's like in all three national academies, super amazing guy, so famous that there was just no chance. So I was basically, like I talked to some of his students and they're like, um, there's no way you can get into his group, and, and so I didn't even talk to him at visiting day. Like, I wasn't even there. Um, so I went back to my little job at Intel, you know, in one day, and I was like, man, this is really stressful. Like, I can't find an advisor, and without an advisor, I don't have anyone to support me. Like, how am I going to do this? 
And Frank at that point started working at Novellus, which is um, a semiconductor company. So all of a sudden, I get an email. Guess from whom? From Bill Nix himself, <laughs> like the amazing, amazing Bill Nix. And basically, it says something like, hey, Julia, I saw that, congratulations, I saw that you got into Stanford. Um, I have this project that's fully funded. Um, you know, it's on the mechanical properties of materials, so I don't know if that's interesting to you. Um, but, you know, if you might possibly be interested in this project, you know, why don't you come down and, and, and we'll chat? And I was like, oh, my God. I was wow. like, I will bring coffee to you. I was like, the great Bill Nix emailed me. So I was like, I don't care what I did. I could care less about what my project was about because I'm like, I'll just bring you slippers and coffee every day if I could be in your group because I'm like, this is unfathomable, right? Yeah, so that's how it happened and I completely had to shift my focus again towards mechanical behavior of materials and so that's how I got into Stanford and then it was all backwards from there. I don't know if you're ready for that next part of the story. Well, no, so the, what were you doing at Intel the second time? Was it the same work? You said you went Not to the Not at group. all, no, no, no. What was Actu it? Actually, working at Intel the second time is what solidified my desire to go to grad school. Uh -huh. I was working in something called IMO, Intel Mask Operations. So we were making maps. So to make a microprocessor, you have to transfer patterns from light, right? So you shine light through a mask, through a pattern, and then you transfer that pattern into something that's called a photoresist, and then you etch away the parts that didn't get exposed, or depending if it's positive or negative, or did get exposed, but you basically transfer the pattern that's written on the mask, like a, a, a snowflake, or a pattern, or any feature um, into a micropro into parts that eventually become microprocessors. So I was in charge of a bunch of masks, in, in charge of their design, in charge of their making, in charge of their going to the right fab and all that. I was the integration engineer. Did you appreciate the Caltech Intel connections, Gordon Moore, Carver Mead? Did you recognize any of that when you were working there? Not at all. Not at all. I knew about Gordon Moore. I met Andy Grove, uh -huh. who was the CEO at that time. and. Uh, uh, Bill Nix's friend, Craig Barrett, who eventually became the CEO of Intel. Yeah. Yeah, I met them both, but no, no connection at all. Did you meet Ted Jenkins? Eventually I did. Eventually, yeah, but not yeah, then. Not then, no. Now you said this experience convinced you you wanted to go to graduate school. Yeah. Why? What about it? Well, when you work at a company, they only care that you make things work. They don't yeah. really care why they don't. It's not fundamental research. Not only is it not fundamental research, but there's no bandwidth for even asking, like, it's not curiosity driven. Right. It's product driven. Right. It's very, very product driven. So basically there would be situations where something didn't work and there would be a SWAT team and you would go and like figure out, well, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do that? Then you figure out what it is and you just move on. Yeah. And so it was just like, intellectually speaking, it was a little bit unsatisfying. Yeah. It was very fast paced, very intense. But not all that interesting by the second year, yeah. to be honest. You know, also, it's probably because of my job. Like, I was an integration engineer, so I didn't go deeply into any... Like, I wasn't responsible for etch. I wasn't responsible for deposition. I wasn't responsible for laser writer. Like, I wasn't responsible for a particular area, which possibly would have been a lot more interesting. I was responsible for the overall process. And so it was just like, at some point, I felt like I was this glorified... Organizer, yeah, of other people, right? Like it felt really cool at first because I was like, "Wow, I'm the youngest one here, and everybody listens to me," you know. But then at some point, I was like, "What am I doing? Like, what is, what's interesting about this?" And there wasn't. Now, this was right around the time of the dot com crash. That's right. Did you feel that at Intel? Did that reverberate? Very much so. Yeah, there was the dot com crash. The Y two K happened, uh, right. Short, basically, I, grad, I mastered, I got my master's degree in 2000, in the spring of 2000. And so that was Y2K, and then I started Intel, and then the white, and then the dot com crash happened. I mean, luckily we bought a house in San Francisco, so that was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. When we first started, they had all these great events. There were like little dinner cruises, and the interns all had a car. Get this when I was an intern at Intel, an intern at Intel, every intern got a rental car with no questions asked. And if like you didn't like your car for whatever reason, you just like would go in return and get another one. They gave every inter I think it was like a car per two. Every two interns got a free car. And I was like, this is absurd. And they had like all these parties, love it, like really great. Yeah. When I was there as a real person, there were no more parties. There were no more free events. But yeah, you could tell. You could really tell. And things got a lot more intense and a lot more like a lot less freebie. 
So do you have any idea how you got on Bill's radar? How did he know about you? Yeah, Bill Nix? Yeah. Yeah, well, I took classes from him, uh -huh. right? Because remember, I was a Stanford student right. for a while. And so, right. like, even though I didn't work in his group. So he, he knew who you were. He actually taught all the classes that I'm teaching now. Uh -huh. So I'm teaching both classes that he taught. Uh -huh. And so he knew who I was. Yeah, of course. It's not such a big program. Yeah. Yeah, and I smile a lot. So I am a happy person, <laughs> right? So he's like, I remember you, smiley face. Yeah, so he remembered me. I must have made an impression. I don't know why. <laughs> and what was that like when you when you met him and discussed the project? I fell off my chair. Like, literally, yeah. I was sitting at Intel, you know, or standing. I had a stand-up desk, just like I do here. Yeah. Um, uh, typing away, doing something, and I just lost it. I was like, oh, my God. And that was really your ticket. That was your Pivotal. way back in. It was, inc well, he was the first person who, like, really believed in me. Yeah. Up to this point, it was a lot of people not so much believing in me. Right, or like not, it's like you can't get into MIT, you can't do this, you can't do that, like you can't get into grad school, and like you, I didn't get into Kemi Berkeley. So it was a lot of, not, a lot of um, uh, aspects of my life were facilitating this imposter syndrome, right? Like they were basically like, you're right, you're not good enough, right? Like, or you're a bad scientist, like up to that point, yeah. right? And I was, I just believed him. I was like, so I'm not so good. So Bill Nix was the first like professional person who was like, Actually, you're not so bad, right? Yeah, and boy, do you see how well that worked out? <laughs> Tell yeah. me about the project once you signed on. Well, <coughs> funny story. So up to that point, I'd only worked on electronic materials mm -hmm. and transistors and Intel relevant things. Here's Bill Nix, who could care less about devices and about anything translational. He's very fundamental, sure. like th stresses and thin films and mechanical properties of materials are very, very, very different. So he basically said, there's this new instrument here um, called the focused ion beam, FIB. Um, and I was thinking that you could make little tiny nano pillars out of something. Go figure out that instrument. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go figure out this instrument. Nano pillars, sure. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time getting intimately familiar with my friend, the FIB. Um, and because I was so young, my shift was from 2 a.m. until 6 a.m. I was the lowest on the totem pole, of course. Right, and so it was. I, it was really late at night, and I was super tired, and I was like getting to know that fib, and then there's the nano indenter, and I made the gold nano pillars. And at some point, I remember I went to him, and I was like, "Why am I making the nano pillars? Like, what's, what are we measuring here?" So he said, "Like, well, there is some work that suggests that, um, okay, in every textbook, you will learn. I'm, I'm just telling you this. Um, in every textbook, we learn that if you take a brick." and you measure its strength, like we call it yield strength, but basically strength is one thing. Say you break the brick in two, still gonna have the same strength. Say you break the brick in four, it's gonna have the same strength. So this particular material property called the yield strength, or strength, or fracture strength, or toughness, or anything like that, is a material property that's independent of size, right? So it doesn't matter how big the brick is. It's, it could be huge, it could be small, it will break at the same strength. Well. So it turns out that when you make things at the nanoscale, it's all upside down, and it becomes very much dependent on size, with smaller being stronger. This is not something that anybody could have anticipated or anybody knew about, right? And so I guess the, his previous student, Mike, um, kind of hinted at that. Like he did some experiments, not with nanopillars, but with sort of small-ish micron-sized pill pillars and showed that the strength is actually higher in those small ones. But it was kind of like just one off, like one experiment. So maybe he was wrong. So I, so I think that the point of Bill Nix pointing me to making the nano pillars was to dem like to probe whether that's real or not. And so here I was, you know, I came as a clean slate. Like I didn't know any of that research. I didn't actually speak mechanical properties. That wasn't. I was working in electronic materials. So made those. I managed to make the nano pillars, right? And managed to test them. Figured out all that stuff. And boy, were they stronger. So gold is typically, I worked with gold. Gold is typically a very malleable metal, very soft, very easy to deform, but when you make it at 200 nanometers, right, so it's like one ten thousandth of your hair diameter, it becomes as strong as steel. And we were like, is this real? Like, is this really happening? So yeah, so I passed my qualifying exam. So I did all the things that the PhD students are supposed to do, but I have taken, I had taken um, most of my classes before. Right, so I didn't have to do I didn't have to take them over for the most part, so I could focus on research. And so in my third year, summer, I think before, so I got to go to a conference, I got to show this research, didn't think much of it, just like that it was interesting. Um, and then at some point he's like, we should really write this up. And I was like, all right, let's publish a paper. I don't know anything about publishing papers. 
wrote up this paper and it got accepted right away. I was like, easy peasy. Like, everybody <laughs> does that. Everybody has that experience. You write a paper and it just gets accepted, right? Boy. So, um, where did you submit? Acta Materialia, which was like the, fl which is the, the flagship uh, materials journal. We should have submitted it to science. And eventually we did submit something to science. There was some controversy and whatever. But that paper to this day is considered to be pretty seminal. Like yeah. it, it gets cited once a week since that time, since yeah. 2004, I guess. Well, I think it came out mm -hmm. in 2005, but since 2000. So I was a third year grad student came out in 2005. If you look at the number of citations, it's it's uh, once per week. So it's 52 times a year at least. So I want to go back to the FIB instrument. Yeah, yeah. What did it look like? How do you work with it's it? It's awesome. I was a little bit like Scarlett O'Hara because I was like, I was so fed up with doing the with doing the 2 a.m. To, to 6 a.m. shift that I was like, uh, someday I'm going to have my own FIB and I will never be fibbing at night again. And what do you know? I have my own FIB yes. and I love the FIB. It's actually my, my favorite instrument. What does it look like? It looks like um, a big vacuum chamber with a whole bunch of like things in it. So there's an ion source and an electron source, and there's this like thing that lifts things up. How is up. the ion so ion source created? Where does it come from? Gallium. There are gallium ions. In oh, it. Yeah. So big vacuum chamber, and then there's this liquid metal ion source um, of gallium, and it shoots gallium um, ions at the material and it etches it away. So you can make like a nano toilet or nano anything, nano yeah. pillars. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a big vacuum chamber with a thing underneath and a whole bunch of things sticking out of ports. Is there safety considerations? Uh, you could just use it without without protective equipment? Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah, it, it's in a vacuum. Right. So everything is in a vacuum chamber. So you have to vent the chamber, and then you go move it out. You, very, you have to wear gloves, of course. You, you put your tiny little sample on the sample holder into the stage, and then you go and then you pump it down to vacuum and, and then why, you see it why gold uh why did i work with gold yeah it's a pretty standard metal that doesn't form an oxide so i could have worked with platinum too um but all the other ones like copper and aluminum and nickel all the other it was important to work with an fcc metal with a so-called face center cubic metal um and there are very few that don't form an oxide and they're all very expensive so gold and platinum so you found that the yield strength actually goes up the thinner the material is. Not only goes up, it goes up in the power law fashion. So it goes up as whatever the strength is to the power of M. So it's not linear. It's so, very, very much. Going. So why? Why does it do that? Because of how the defects in nanos, because in nanostructures, the defects behave very differently. So when you are dealing with a big bulk crystal, all of your defects, which are affectionately known as dislocations, which is the class that I teach from which I just came, um, they kind of operate collectively in concert. And there's this textbook law that I just taught called Taylor Relation, which says that the stress is proportional to the square root of the dislocation density. So the greater the dislocation density, the greater the strength. What we discovered is that in the, at the nanoscale, it's the opposite. Because the dislocation density drops down so low that you now have a scarcity or of dislocations, or we call it dislocation starvation. So you basically starve your crystal of dislocations. And now, but dislocations are your units of plasticity. That the reason why we're able to bend a paper clip is because we're moving these dislocations around and they accommodate that shape change. So if our world were ideal, everything would just break. Everything would be extremely strong, but then they would just break. Nothing would be deformable. So the dislocations enable metals to be deformable. And typically, in typical metals, you're constantly multiplying them, which is the process that's called cold working, right, or strain hardening. So, so that you, by the virtue of multiplying your dislocations, you get material to be stronger. Well, in our pillars, we actually ran out of, because they were so small and there was always a surface available next to the dislocations, the dislocations ran out. They, once you start deforming them, they would run out of the crystal. Now, you have a crystal that's basically perfect, and it's, it doesn't have enough dislocations in it to accommodate further deformation. But we're still deforming it. And as we're still deforming it, somewhere, the dislocations have to come from somewhere. Otherwise, we won't be able to deform it, right? So they have to be nucleated. And to nucleate something, to form something, requires a tremendously larger amount of energy than to move something. So we basically were in this dislocation starvation regime where we had to nucleate, to, to produce new dislocations, which is what requires a much greater force. Why the term nucleate? Why does nucleate create these new dislocations? 
that's just a very typical scientific term. When you nu nucleating something means forming it. Yeah, it's it's just a typical term to nucle. When something nucleates, it's um, yeah. In the atomic in the atomic jargon, you nucleate things. Everything nucleates, like a particle ne nucleates, uh, dislocation nucleates. It's just it's just a nucleation and growth is something you learn about material. It's a material science term. So what is the actual mode of action of, of, of the fib device? Does it break? Does it split? Does it fry? The fib carves. Carves. The fib carves a structure. Kind of like imagine uh, a butter cow at a, at a, a kind of county fair. Yeah. So you carve it out, right? Like imagine you have butter uh -huh. and then you carve it out. It's a subtractive process. So you start with a chunk and then you etch away all the things you don't want. Kind of like a CNC machine. Kind of like a what? A CNC machine. What's it a has, CNC? It's, a, it's a rotating blade and you put a block of wood and it carves whatever yeah. shape you want. Yeah, kind of like that. Exa or a knife with butter. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So you carve out exactly the shape that you want out of just a fl out of just a chunk. But to measure the strength or the resistance of the deformation, that was a different just, instrument. That's a different instrument. That's a different instrument that's called a nano inventor. I Got should it. have mentioned that a Got little it. more explicitly. Two instruments that I worked with. Yeah. So what Bill Nix so Bill Nix was known at that point that he on um, um, the mechanical behavior of thin films. Like he won a medal on that. He is very well known in the mechanical deformation of thin films, right? But this is entirely new because now we're dealing with nano, like a thin film is a two-dimensional object, which behaves very differently. Some, it hints, hints at the behavior of what a, just like a standalone nanostructure could do, but there was no way to infer it. Right. So I was the first person in his group to work on these nano pillars that are very, very different, but to probe them mechanically, you can use the same instrument that's called the nano indenter, but what a nanodenter does is it's a sharp diamond tip, and you basically drive it into your thin film. It was developed specifically for thin films and for bulk, bulk metals. And as you deform your metal underneath, you can get its elastic properties and even get some information about its hardness. So that's a plastic property. Um, but it doesn't allow you to measure stresses or strains. It doesn't allow, which are like the key parameters in any mechanical behavior. Yeah. And so people were kind of obsessed with nanodentation, and it was one of his former students, two of his former students that kind of developed uh, this technique. And so it was something that was used by a lot of his students, and I didn't want to be the N plus first. And he specifically told me that he didn't want me to be the N plus first person working on nanodentation because there's very little left to break new ground. So I was doing an entirely different- Meaning was he was sensitive for your career prospects, basically. <coughs> This was you going know, to be your calling card. In retrospect, possibly, I don't know. I honestly don't know because nobody knew what was going to come out of it. It was an entirely untapped territory. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think he was so much looking out for my career. I think it was more like he was ready. Like he mm -hmm. was no, he didn't want another student working on the same yeah. uh, set of problems. Like that's how I would treat my students now too. Like say, say there's this process that we developed and somebody new comes in, it's not so much that I'm looking out for their career because I will make sure that their career does well, but it's just there's so little space left for doing something truly innovative in something that you've already been doing for a long, long time sure. that you kind of like find a person and you're like, you know what, why don't you go try this? Because you're young and you can and like I can afford for you to spend a year trying something new. So I think it was more like that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more like an exploratory um, type thing. Now, did you know from when he introduced you to this project that this would be your thesis research? No. I, he just told me, go learn the FIB. And I was like, okay, never heard of the FIB before. I don't know what it does, but I'm going to go figure it out. No, it was very little guidance. And the paper made a splash immediately? The paper made a huge splash. I got invited to all kinds of conferences. I won all kinds of awards. It was amazing. And then what happened after that <coughs> was even more amazing. So I was a third year grad student. Right very young right and um so i got the little mrs gold award one of this one for that research and it was kind of a big deal we didn't quite a we didn't have, we couldn't have predicted how big the, of a splash that bill was, was as surprised as anyone uh, exactly bill was more we call him boss the boss was more surprised i probably lengthened his career by about a decade <laughs> just by like doing these ridiculous they were challenging experiments, and no one had done them before except for that guy, Mike. Yeah. But he worked with a much bigger length scale. Like, no one had done the nano things. And so because because of that, like, there was some competition, and this other, these German people were like, 
oh, you know, they were trying to shoot us down. There was some drama, anyway. So what happened was that I went to present this research. Do you know who Harry Atwater is? Of course. Okay. Of course. So I did my little award talk at the MRS, and this dude, this dude right here, came up to me after that, and then he said, I would like to invite you to present this research at a German castle, at, at this amazing castle in Germany. We're inviting you, so we'll pay for everything. And I was like, what? Like, usually you invite <laughs> the advisor. Like, you can't invite a grad student, right? And I was like, what the heck is all this about? So, and I was like, is this legit? And, like, it seemed legit. And there was this workshop called Lazarian, and he, I guess he was impressed with my, I don't know why, but he invited me. So I went to Bill Nix, to the boss, and I was like, boss, you're not gonna believe this. I got invited to give this talk and it's in the, Ger the old German castle. Um, what uh, What do you think I should do? Like, what What do you make of this? And he kind of looked, he's like, well, let me look at the list of participants. So he's looking at the, looking at the list and he's like, uh-huh, Harry Atwater. I know that guy, he's your guy, stick with him. And I was like, who is Harry Atwater? I have no idea any of this. So we went, this is the picture from there. Here's Harry Atwater, right? That's me being a little grad student. <laughs> Where was Harry at that point? Was Here. he? He was at Caltech. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. Yes, yes. He was definitely at Caltech. Okay. Now, <coughs> I should mention one more thing. I had a friend named Christine in grad school at Stanford, who left Stanford to go to Caltech. So I knew not. The only things I knew about Caltech was that Einstein was here. Richard Feynman. I really loved all those books. Surely you were joking, sure. uh, Mr. Feynman. Um, and that's it. And then my friend Christine, who went to Caltech. Now, I didn't, we weren't close friends or anything like that, so all I knew just sort of like through the grapevine was that she worked for somebody, but then that somebody went to Harvard, like her advisor went to Harvard for a little while, um, and then he came back, but she stayed at Caltech or something like that. So like I just knew something about that. It's totally independent. So here I am at this Lazarian workshop with all these men, a lot of men, um, and I needed to leave a little earlier I guess, and I asked at some point, I was like, hey, is anyone going back to the airport like on this day because I can't stay longer? And so this guy, Harry Atwater, whom I hadn't met before, uh, is like, oh, well, I'm gonna go to the airport a little bit earlier too. Um, do you wanna come with me? And I was like, are you Harry Atwater? I was like, oh my God, <laughs> Like, I, my boss told me I should stick with you, you know? So we're on the freeway, on the Audubon, and this guy is a driving maniac. He's going so fast, so fast. And I just got really nervous because I'm like, I'm alone, I'm like, really young. What's happening? <laughs> What's happening? I'm a third year grad student. This guy's driving really fast. Also, he wasn't talking to me very much. Like he wasn't, we weren't bonding or anything like that. Like we were just kind of chatting in a forced way. And he's going 150 like kilometers per hour. It was very fast. And I was so nervous. When I get nervous, I start talking a lot, even more. And so I just was like, Oh, you're Harry Atwater, you're a professor at Caltech. Oh my God, I don't know anything about Caltech, except I know I have this friend, and she worked for this crazy advisor who was at Caltech, and then he went to Harvard, and then I guess he didn't like Harvard, and then he went back to Caltech, and I don't know what that was all about. And at that point, there's dead silence in the car, and that was the first time that he actually turned around and looked at me, and he goes, that was me. And I was like, <laughs> shit. I was like, you can just let me out here. I'll just walk to the airport. It's okay. I don't need to get to the airport. You know, I was so embarrassed, so embarrassed. I had the temerity to offend, offend the great Harry Atwater without even knowing this. So what do you know? We get to the airport. He ditches me. He goes to the United Club, of course. And I'm, again, I'm like, oh, I'm going to fly back home to Stanford. And like a few weeks later, the boss walks into my office and he goes, hey, Julia, so Caltech called. And I was like, great. And he goes, they want to interview you for a faculty position. And I was like, wow. what? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, no, no, <laughs> they really do. So there was a professor here, so Sina Haile. I don't know if you yeah. know her. She's at Northwestern now. Yep. So I guess I must have impressed Harry Atwater so much <laughs> by being so like, uh, like rude to him that he, we had a, they had a search here. So he must have told so Sina about me. And so I met her at the MRS, and she was the search chair, which I didn't know about, but she called, but they called the boss, and they're like, what's Julia thinking? And he's like, what do you mean she's thinking? She hasn't graduated, like, she hasn't defended her dissertation, and she hasn't, like, even looked for her postdocs yet. Yeah. And she's very green, and they're like, well, we want to interview her. And I was like, you are kidding me, this must be some kind of a joke. So I was completely unprepared, I submitted this package, which I knew nothing, like, so young, right, like a third year grad student. Um, so. Here I was at Caltech, I'm like, well, you know what? I'm just gonna enjoy myself because 
there's no way I'm going to get this job. And actually, I called Sosena and I was like, you guys want to interview me? And she's like, yeah, you know, why don't you come and give your talk, prepare this? And I was like, do you have any advice for what I should do? And she basically said, you're never going to get this job. Maybe not in so many words, but I got that message loud and clear. That basically she says, she said, you have to demonstrate the same level of maturity as people who've had several years of postdoc already under their belt. So it's very unlikely that you would even get this position, but why don't you come and tell us about your full time? And I was like, message received. I'm never going to get this job. It's going to be just a fun trip. And so I was completely relaxed. Like, I wasn't even nervous. I Low didn't stakes. Even, exactly. Like, I was like, this is never going to happen. This is not real. So I came. Also, <laughs> I was in the process of preparing to play a solo with the Redwood Symphony, the Brahms Second Piano Concerto, which is kind of like a big, big, big piece. So my mind was like somewhere else. Like I was, I was getting ready to defend, but kind of like all that stuff was at the same time happening at the same time as I was preparing this big concerto concert. So I was like, it was an intense period in my life. So I came, I had a great time. I met some amazing people here. I told them all about my nanopillars research and they were really excited and I was like, yeah, this is a cool project. It's about dislocations, it's nanofillers. I, I'm so excited about it too. Like it was just not, not scary. It was like fun. It was fun. And so like I had a great time here. Went back home, and then two weeks later, the boss walks in again. He goes, "Hey, Julia, MIT called. <laughs> they would like to interview you for a faculty position." But this time I knew what I was getting myself into, and so I was like, "All right." I put together the same pad, so I knew what I, what was going on, and I was like, maybe this research is actually kind of exciting. Like people really think that there's something to it. So that happened, and then I started interviewing for my postdoc positions, and then I defended. So it was like totally backwards. Sorry, do you mind if I yeah, take, take it? Yeah. Sorry. sorry. And we're back. Sorry, and we're back. But now you were ready for a proper faculty presentation at MIT. Right. How did that go? And what were your experiences like comparing MIT and Caltech? Very different. Caltech was so fun. Caltech, everybody, everybody at Caltech seemed happy. Like they had pictures of their children, pictures of their families. Like they were fun people. I yeah. mean, also it was California, you know, so it was like sunny and happy and I just got like a really good vibe here. And MIT was, I mean, it was MIT, so for me, it was a very nostalgic experience, right? Because my undergrad, whole undergrad, like basically the formative years, right? Like that's when I truly became an American, really. Um, it was a lot of personal growth. There was a lot of assimilation. It was a lot of sort of integrating into. But you were also seeing it at a very different time in your life. Right, but all, it brought back all these memories, right? And so being, it was very surreal being interviewed for a faculty position there. And having all these professors who used to be my professors be colleagues yeah. as I was a third year grad student. Like it was strange. It, w it was a great experience. I mean, it was like more like an awe. I was, and, and I was a bit more nervous, right? And so it was really, it was a powerful experience. Yeah. Caltech's experience wasn't powerful. It was more like fun. Uh -huh. Like I don't have another better way to describe it. It was really just, going and talking about my work to a bunch of people that cared about it and it was fun like it was no there was no I didn't feel scared I didn't feel any pressure I didn't feel nervous like it was just a great scientific conversation or many many great scientific conversations but at MIT it was scary and it was you know it was what a faculty interview you would imagine it to be like so it was intense and scary and I mean I think I did pretty well I mean I, at the end of the day but it was very different did you feel like you were being seriously considered for both? Or that it was more like... Not at no Caltech, way. but I very much felt that way at MIT. Yeah. Yeah. At Caltech, I knew I wasn't going to get this job. Like, I really went in with that attitude because of what Sosina told me. Yeah. Fun fact, Sosina had a four-year-old son, Alam, who is now in my group and in my class. Oh, that's it awesome. It is so, so heartwarming. That's I awesome. I sort of still can't get over it. Because I'm like, this is the kid I babysat when right. he was four years old when I first got here. Right. And now he's a Caltech student and he's in my lab. He's working in my lab. This is crazy. So you said at the same time you're also applying for postdocs. Yeah. Because that's what they do. Right. This is what a lot of faculty uh, searches now do. They like to snatch the talent. We're doing this right now. Uh, from grad school, 
straight from grad school and then just send them to do a postdoc so that they could mature. So I did that. So I did everything backwards. I got my faculty position first, then I interviewed for my postdocs, got my postdoc position, and then I depended. <laughs> yeah, it was that. Most people do it the opposite. Most people right. depend first, then get a postdoc, then get a faculty. Where did you get offers? With those two. Caltech and MIT. Yeah, I didn't interview anywhere else. So Caltech and the end of the day actually gave you an offer. They were so quick. They gave me an offer like two weeks after. MIT took a long time. But um, So do you think that the advice that you received was <laughs> incorrect? That your prospects were actually better? Or did you display the level of maturity that you were told you needed to display? Because it has to be one or the other. I think I really charmed them, honestly. Like, I think I just was so excited about my research, genuinely. Yeah. Very excited about my research with no reservations. And I was just, I think it really showed. Like, I'm a pretty dynamic person. So I think I really was like, look, this nanofiller stuff is actually really elegant and you can learn so much. And look, this is defying every theory in every textbook that we yeah. teach. You know, like this is yeah. kind of big, you know, and it's like, and look, we can apply it to this and we can apply it to that. And I met with all these people and we, and I connected with everyone on some level. So I think that I charmed them, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Who were some of the faculty that you interacted with on that, on that faculty visit? Definitely Harry. Yeah. Bill Johnson. Did you have a, a better experience with him at that Much point? Much better experience <laughs> with him. He's my friend. He's one of my favorite people here, actually. I love, love, love Harry. Yeah, he's definitely one of my favorite people here. So Sina, uh -huh. uh, Bill Johnson, Brent Foltz, Kaushik Bhattacharya, Ravi Ravichandran, yeah. Rob Phillips, uh, Julie Cornfield. Aris Hazakis, was he part of that? No, he, Aris wasn't a part of him. At least I don't think I met him that, that time. at that time. Kiara, I think I met Kiara DeRio. Oh, maybe not during my search, actually. Yeah, no, no. And so it was a pretty easy decision between Caltech and MIT so for you? Easy. Oh yeah. my God, it was like no brainer. Yeah. I told people I didn't want to change my driver's license, but it was not, <laughs> not that at all. No, it was just a very, I just, I felt like I belonged here. Like it was. So they said, come, defend, postdoc, and then join the faculty. Exactly. Richard Murray was my was the division chair at that time. He basically called and he's like, we'd like to make you an offer. So then at that point I had to grow up really quickly because they're like, what equipment do you want? What kind of lab do you want? And I was like, oh my God. Like again, I'm a third year grad yeah. student. Like let's not forget. I was really yeah. unprepared for life at that point. Right. And so I had a pretty rough experience as a postdoc actually. Um, because, it, not because, but anyway, um, <coughs> they said that, they said we would like to make you an offer this is very exciting. We think that you're bringing an entirely new research direction here. And I was like, oh, thanks. Uh, but I said, I would like to go do a postdoc because you guys don't have, they didn't have the FIB. Or they, sorry, they had the FIB, but it wasn't in the clean room. They were still building the Kavli Nanoscience Institute, which I now direct. Right. But at that time, they were just building it. And so it wasn't ready. And I was like, I don't want my tenure clock to be ticking while they're building sure. the facilities, you know, while they're building stuff, because it's just going to waste my time. So I said, I'd like to go to a postdoc. And they said, we would also like you to go to a postdoc because you're too green. That's what building said, told them. They're like, what's Julia thinking? He's like, I'm thinking that she's too green. And I was. And so I did an almost two-year postdoc, actually. They said it, for, and they waited. Where did you do your postdoc? At Park, Palo Alto Research, Research Center. Oh. When the mouse was invented. Yes. In the internet. Yeah, I was at Xerox Park. Yeah. What did you do while you were there? Oh my God. Did they have a fib? No, I worked on an entirely different thing. I worked on thin film electronics, thin film transistors, on compliant substrates. I worked on something completely unrelated to my current research. But this was much more fundamental than the work you were doing at Intel. No, it was like halfway. It wasn't much more fundamental. It was much more like what I was doing at Intel, but they were actually making innovative products. So it was somewhere in between. Yeah. It's like a wholly owned subsidiary of Xerox, right? Right. So the pro I was put on a project that was kind of fun and more fundamental in nature, but they were making devices. So much less fundamental than grad school, but more fundamental than Intel. Now, the thesis defense, was that almost an afterthought? Was yeah. it more hurried than it otherwise would have been? It was a thing I had to do before I played, or I was really focused on my bronze concerto. Yeah. Like, the, my parents flew out. I, honestly, I don't remember my thesis defense very well. Yeah, it's a yeah, blur. It's a blur. My parents came out, and, yeah, I don't remember my defense very well. It was a big deal, I'm sure. Yeah. But it's just like my mind was somewhere else. I was, like, really focusing on the bronze. 
Was Bill useful when you had, you said you had to grow up really fast? Like, what do you need for the lab? Was he a resource for you in that regard? Or you figured it out on your own? You know, he wasn't a resource for figuring out the startup because I talked to some younger. He is still my go-to person for every kind of advice. And I love him and respect him tremendously. But I think for setting up the lab, I didn't go to him. I went to some younger people who were doing they're, work. They're closer I'll, to the research. Closer to the research yeah. and that were closer to my age, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just because like he hadn't gone through this process of negotiating for like 45 years or 50 years. He had just retired. So he was very much sunsetting his career. And so I talked to some people who were much more right. relevant to right. that time. So did you feel for the postdoc you were really just biding your time until the fib was ready? You know, I went through a little bit of a crisis in my postdoc. I think it was too much. Like, I think all of that intensity, like the way I'm describing it now, is kind of like fun. A lot happened it real was fast. A, a lot happened real fast, and I got pregnant, and like I really wanted to have a kid, and my husband, we were going through some really, really rough times. It was a lot. The, the Brahms concerto was too much, and the defense was too much, and getting a faculty offer when you're like 26 years old was crazy. Like, it was, it was too much. So it took like an... I, definitely had some kind of a mental breakdown I think when I was there like I was not eating and not like not doing so well so I took it easy like I learned a lot I took it easy like thank God that I had this offer because I don't think it would have materialized had I not now was there a two-body problem or you knew that you were just both gonna come down here they were awesome they created a job for him at JPL uh -huh. I mean, he has a PhD from Berkeley and is a pretty smart guy, right? So right. when we first came, Caltech basically said, we don't do two body problems. We don't, we don't, we basically, they said, we don't accommodate spouses. And I was like, well, what are we going to do? And so they said, well, let's see if we can come up with something at JPL. Right. And so in the two, because it took so long to, for me to do my postdoc, like almost three years, yeah. that in that amount of time, they sort of made a position, they made him an offer from JPL in his own right. But it, it's good to have had that Absolutely. time because otherwise we would have had I moved actually by myself four months pregnant by myself uh, but he came like a, like a month or a couple of months later was the postdoc useful for when you wanted to get going at Caltech or not really it was it was it really um, it really was it, it, maybe not in terms of the research but in terms of growing up, like in terms of becoming more independent, in yeah. terms of making decisions, in terms of like, what, how do I plan my lab? What am I going to do? What, how, who am I going to hire? Like, what am I going to do? Because all of a sudden, you know, money was never, like the financial aspect of things was never a part of my grad school. Right. And it just wasn't something I was, I had ever experienced. Like the, like I also don't, like I don't really involve my students in proposal writing even now. Sometimes only like when it's a cool idea. But the financial I feel like that's for grown-ups, right? And so, like, as a grad student, I was never a part of it. And so at Park, I got a little bit of a preview for what it's like to write a proposal. I remember I worked on my career proposal, like, for six months. Most PIs work on their proposals for, like, three weeks. Yeah. I had six months. I, like, really planned it out. I was like, I'm going to totally write this, and I got it. <laughs> so it was great. But, yeah, I spent a lot of time learning how to write proposals and how to, um, yeah, it, it was a self-care postdoc. <laughs> All right, so last question for today. We'll pick up next time. You joined the faculty at Caltech. This long period of time where you're waiting for the FIB gave you probably an opportunity to think about, like, what are you going to do when you become a faculty uh, member? 100%. So how, how strategic were you, like, from day one? Did you have a really good idea of what you wanted to accomplish, or did you recognize Caltech being Caltech? It's all about meeting people and going to the AF and going to seminars and, like, figuring out what's fun. What, what was your sense of how to manage all of that as a brand new faculty member? It was overwhelming. It was all of the above. Everything, this is a really well posed question. Like it's um, all of that. I didn't know. And we didn't have, a, Caltech has really changed and in general academia has really changed. We didn't have mentors. Yeah. We now have a mandatory mentorship program. So like I'm mentoring a younger faculty member. We didn't have anyone like that. I actually, for next time, save a story. There's a story that came with how I was brought here because I traveled a few times I traveled from Stanford to come here to sort of like to attend like the opening of the k and right like yeah. the Catholic or like to attend like a graduate admissions meeting or something like that like sort of there were discrete events where I would come in and do something and then I would fly back so a part of it was a, 
I want to say it was strategic because I really carefully thought about it, what I wanted to do. And the everything was on my side in the sense that it was a new field that I found it. Like when we first started doing the nanopillars research, it was an it was very new. It was like a new game in town. By the time I got here, there was not a single materials conference without a full symposium dedicated to it. And yeah. I started that. Yeah. Like so it was really kind of a testament to like that research being really meaningful. And people recognize that. Like with even with all the fighting and all the stuff, like people knew that we were first, the yeah. first ones to yeah. like there's a little bit of like who was really first, but it wasn't people knew that we were we kind of started that field, right? Yeah. And so I had the it was lucky that because it was such a new young field that there was a lot of a lot to be discovered. There was enough place under the sun for everyone. So I had as part of my strategy, I knew which way I wanted to move and I knew what I wanted to do. But there's like an army of Germans that have just like a ton of people and a ton of resources that basically just reproduce whatever you do a hundred times. And so I learned very quickly that to stay ahead of the game, I couldn't do I couldn't just continue right. to do the N plus one thing. Yeah. So like I never did that. And so we would always I would always seek out new ways, new collaborations. And that's where the postdoc came in very handy. I'm so glad I learned about the thin films because I scored some kind of a collaborative proposal that got funded doing electronic properties. And I was like, hey, look at that. I know about electronic properties of graphene. It was about graphene. I would have never learned about graphene had I not done that postdoc and like oh, wow. measured transistors and like actually understood what that meant, mobility. I was like, what is mobility? So it was great. It was useful. So like despite every, the personal crisis, it really was good for you. Despite the personal crisis, crisis, it was a great place for me. It was very nurturing. I met amazing people. One of the people I met there is now the chair of the material science department at Stanford. Now, I met, I made great friends. I had a good time. Like it was, I think I needed. Like it was a break. Yeah. It was a break because yeah. it was just it was escalating at such a fast rate that it was just like too much. And I think had I not been myself, something would have broken down. But I did. I pulled off the Brahms. I pulled off the faculty position, I pulled off the defense, I worked out. And I have a beautiful, I had a beautiful baby girl. Five months later. Five months later, so it, it was intense. Oof. Yeah. We'll pick up next time, starting Sounds life good. in Pasadena. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>